Like, if this is yeah, the best thing yeah. ever produced, we have to publish it, right? Yeah. I mean, even if it's okay, it's probably worth publishing because it's early, but I just, I don't know if it's going to be. We'll find out. All right, we will find out on We Need to Talk. <laughs> is so killer it reminds me of when we used to room in college and i remember basically every single night we would listen to a full pink floyd album do you remember that yeah th those those were the days i mean it's I, I think we actually used to listen to uh dark shadowed moon for quite a bit because it helped us get to sleep or helped me get to sleep at least we did. I, and then we just started playing more and more Pink Floyd albums. Like, there was that one time where I just put on, what was it, uh, Shining You Crazy Diamonds, which you were no. here, you know, from which you were here. No. And neither of us had heard it. And you actually hated the song at first because you're like, fuck, this is catchy, it's good. <laughs> it, get, it gets stuck in your yeah, head. That, that sounds about right. And, God, that, that, that song's amazing. That song is absolutely outstanding, but and it, it seems pretty interesting that you kind of gravitated towards starting at the beginning of their career and then working your way through to see how they progressed. And I started at the end of their career, and I really liked The Division, though. I thought that was an outstanding album, and I think I listened to that before you had ever heard it before. Yeah, I think, I think it's true. You were telling me it was a pretty decent album, and... I always thought you were talking about A Momentary Lapse of Reason, which is an album I almost killed myself to. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's actually a pretty good album, but I was skeptical because there's just Gilmore by himself and, you know, the other guys, but mostly just Gilmore. Oh, yeah. M Mason was involved, kind of. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. Wright was involved a little bit, not really. He was a hired musician, I believe, but I do think Mason was on board on that one. Mason, Mason's always kind of confusing though, because like during the whole Division Bell tour, he had a second drummer with him because he couldn't actually drum, you know, carry the whole drumming by himself. Mm -hmm. He kind of like forgot how to drum, or, not forgot, but you know, he just wasn't good enough to keep with it. That's kind of ironic. Yeah, yeah, but, but Gilmore still has it. I mean, he recently released this kind of, not released, but he did this live show where he did a uh, Prince. Yeah, he threw it into Comfortably Numb. He threw in a Purple Rain solo. Yeah, and... God, he, he, he's amazing. But Yeah, they were so seamless. I feel like how, most of the people in the crowd didn't even catch it. Mm. It's like, I expected the crowd to start erupting when he started playing it, but nobody did. Hmm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or maybe this is a bad recording. That could also be the case. Fair enough. I did hear them uh, erupt at the beginning, though, when they did when they he first started playing comfortably numb. Um, so I feel like there should be some sort of balance there. But oh, there, there's, uh, a, there's a whole video out there. I, I just saw the like the, uh, the the part where he goes into the solo. No, I saw it from the very beginning of the song when ah. the lights go out, and then there's a spotlight just on Gilmore, and then uh, and then all the way to the very very end where he finishes the comfortably numb solo. Sounds pretty boss. Yeah. Well, anyway, what's your favorite Pink Floyd album? That would probably be Animals. Really? Why is that? So Animals is some of Gilmore's best guitar work. Or, I don't want to say best, but it's some of his most unique guitar work. So it kind of takes, like, the kind of the bluesiness and brings it into like another whole sphere. It doesn't sound like blues really. And there's okay. a lot of interesting stuff in there. So you appreciate guitar work above most all else? Well also so a lot of the metaphors are pretty cool. I mean it connects back to Animal Farm and I liked that book a lot when I read it in high school. Yeah, high school. 
Uh, but yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Actually, what was your favorite album? I remember in uh, in high school, um, we read Animal Farm sophomore year in Mr. Cool's class, and we did that flash animation, and you presented it. And what grade did you get? I think it was a C minus. And I presented it like an A. The same exact project. How does that happen? And, and now, for anyone who's wondering, we worked in the same project, but we we're in different classes. Or he was in, like, say, block one, and different I was in block period. four. Yeah. yeah, different time periods. And they allowed us to work on it this way. And same teacher, I get a C minus, he gets an A. Now, granted, I had it the day after you had it. That gave us the night after you presented to work on it just a little bit more. And apparently, we did two letter grades worth of work in one night. <laughs> and I did C minus material in two weeks and like and, 40 hours. And to, be, to be fair, you did 90% of the work. Yeah. <laughs> I did little to nothing. I did, I think, some voice acting. Maybe. Were, were you Napoleon? Probably. Uh, oh, wait, was that the time that I swore something and your mom heard it? She's like, I heard that. I oh, know that, that was for the uh, the dare drug thing. So, so there was a thing that we did for it's a health class. It was like drug prevention, or is it su no actually suicide prevention? And there's a scene in it where a cop goes to arrest somebody. And you remember what you said, Steve? No, I don't. So, so Steve was the cop. And he's just kind of ad-libbing. He's just like, sir, put your hands where I can see them and out of your pants. And he, he just kind of yelled it in the house. <laughs> and my mom just kind of like opened the door. It's like, what are you guys doing in there? <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> oh, my God. And we were just like kind of, we, we, we couldn't contain ourselves. It was just like, oh, that was, oh, that was so embarrassing. It, it was, I don't even think you meant to say it either, so. I, I really, uh, half the time I say things insane and I don't mean to say them. They just kind of happen when I'm, when I'm just talking off the cuff, but, you know, it is what it is. It makes a great story eventually down the line. Yeah, it's like, imagining a dog on top of another dog. Oh, man. You're insane. You're insane? <laughs> Um, okay, um, so my favorite album. That's a, a really good question. Um, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of animals. I almost feel like the metaphors in animals are, are, were cliche even by the time Pink Floyd create, started writing about them. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah, I, I'd agree. I'd agree. So, like, it's hard to say that, like, it's such a great album for symbolism when it's already been done. But uh, I definitely agree. It, it has some amazing work on it, especially the guitar work. Um, and there's that one part where it's like, drag down by the stone, the stone, the stone, the stone, the stone, the stone. And it goes on for like another two minutes. Mm. Like that part, I don't, I, I don't, they're pretty ballsy to do that, honestly. Why is that? Well, because like, you know, you, you gotta think, like, this is part's kind of weird. You know, are people actually gonna like this? I mean, it, it takes a lot of guts. It's a very experimental part. And I used to show that to a lot of people and just see how they'd react to it. And a lot of people would be like, what the fuck is this shit? Mm -hmm. And it actually works pretty well within the song. But it's not something that's done very often or not executed very well. I think that's pretty much a Pink Floyd's career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, not to mention, most of their albums were concept albums. So, something might not work out of context, but when you listen to it as a whole, it, it works. Um, take Wish You Were Here. Um, Shine On Part 2 and Part 3 and etc have callbacks to where they started and the start has has um like foreshadowing or whatever the musical term for that is 
right off in the beginning for things that will come later, and they really play into each other. And that's what makes it work on a much deeper level than just the song itself, which, by the way, just the song itself works. And that in itself is amazing that you can listen to a song, but then when you listen to that song in conjunction with other songs, it makes it even better. Hmm. Right, right. And in a way, I mean, this is a pretty bad metaphor, but it's kind of like it's creating its own mythos where, you know, we both watch Game of Thrones and Game of Thrones is interesting just watching it. But then we start realizing there's this whole entire world to, you know, Westeros. You kind of start getting into the world and into the story, into the various kind of uh, tropes and ideas and concepts within the, you know, the show or the book, as some people would have it. Uh, and it's kind of similar with Pink Floyd and uh, Shine On You Crazy, not Shine On, Wish You Were Here. I, I think there's a lot of, like, interconnecting themes. and when, You know, like, you can listen to Wish You Were Here, just a, just a song. You can listen to Shine On You Crazy Diamonds, you can listen to Have Cigar. And those songs are all fantastic. You can listen to those on their own. But then we start getting into the the struggles of, say, the band and how they're communicating that through the songs also you can get into this you know the lyrics as well in the kind of the world to create and it's also how the ideas are put together within the album so it's kind of different levels of kind of introspection or not just of uh inspection into the you know the world of the song i think that makes a really good point that i wasn't even touching on um i was more speaking on the fact that musically it adds a depth to it but you're saying that and correct me if i'm wrong that when you know the actual story behind it, that adds even more to it and gives it just another depth that not only makes it better, but makes it so much more real and relatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really, really good point. And I, th- I think it helps you relate to the artists themselves as well, because because I don't know, something I have a hard time doing sometimes is like. Like, let's, th- let's just think about George R. R. Martin for a second and how he writes Game of Thrones. You know, to us, this, this is just some finished product out there, right? We don't actually think about someone who wrote it. But you ever see him in interviews, he's actually kind of talking about, you know, these complex problems he has to figure out. This guy has to actually think about what he's doing. And then he's going through issues with his life. And, you know, a lot of that comes out through his art and through his work. And you can actually see how they kind of interconnect and there's like someone creating the, the music or you know and mark in this case the book and like kind of reading the work from that kind of point of view or kind of seeing it from this is someone who actually sat down and wrote this or kind of produced this is pretty hard to get your head around yeah so you're saying that knowing the artist's perspective adds another layer of depth um, because it's a different perspective than maybe the way that you were originally listening, which is from your own perspective. Mm. That's awesome. Um, and I think that it also really helps on things that are a little more abstract, um, which takes the song Wish You Were Here. Everybody in the world can relate to that because that's just about loss and it doesn't even necessarily have to mean death, although that really hits a chord for most people. But it could just be something uh, much, much less permanent than death, like, like just losing like a, a, a loved one or um, like a friend or or uh, a significant other or something like that, and, um, and and that can hit people on a really personal level. But then when you actually hear about what the what the band is actually talking about and the fact that it it had a lot to do with Sid and and all of that. That just adds a, a different perspective that not only lets you relate to the song, but lets you relate to the band and reminds you that the band isn't just like this this entity, it's, it's people. And it's mm. people on a really real level. And I think that that's something that like the Beatles did really well um, with John Lennon would, would speak out all the time and talk on a really real level. And I think that that's what, what makes great bands just that next level of greatness is being able to be relatable not just on a an art level but on a personal level that where you transcend 
the band itself. It's like you're a person and then you're a musician and then you're a band and then you're a superstar and then you're a person again. Hmm. And to hit that level, it's just, it's not done very often. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty, it's pretty interesting because, I mean, it, it's something we kind of all know in a way. So, oftentimes, let's say Eminem will write a song about someone, right? It's, uh, and he'll kind of be, he usually goes all out, but let's say it's ambiguous as to who it's about exactly. But, you know, it's obvious he's talking about, say, um, you know, some girl that cheated on him or something. Like, in that kind of case, you can kind of relate to it yourself because, you know, you might have, have had a girl that cheated on you. But then you also kind of say, oh, okay, he, he's actually, get, you know, getting out his frustration, his anger about the girl who, that cheated on him. And so there's that kind of way because that way you're kind of, like, really into his motivation. But then there's also, I think, what you're trying to get at in a way, is there's also the third level where you're kind of relating to him as a person. You're saying, yeah, that kind of sucks. I mean, if I, if I was in that position, some girl cheated on me. I've never had a girl cheat on me, exactly. But, you know, how, how would you interpret that mostly? Would I kind of do that? Would I be kind of, you know, taking it out through my art form if I had one? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm on board with that. Um... Now, uh, I still haven't answered what, what my favorite album is, and that's because I'm just not sure. I know I listened to Dark Side of the Moon. There was one time when, uh, when I had mono, and first I watched uh, every season of House from, from the start to end. Uh, that was great. And then uh, what, what, and we should talk well, about that probably sometime, Was too. that the time you became House? <laughs> um, hey, anyway, I'm probably on. right around that. What's that? <laughs> we're, we're, we're moving on. <laughs> That's another story. Um, that is that'll that'll be another episode. But um, and then after that, I listened to Dark Side of the Moon on repeat for 24 straight hours, 20 with no breaks. Wait, you couldn't sleep or something? Like, no, I fell asleep to it too, but it continued oh. to play. Oh, I see, I see. So, like, and, and I only, I wasn't sleeping very much because when I had mono, my uh, my throat swelled up to the point where at one point I couldn't even breathe and I had to go to the, the doctor and get um, whatever it's called, uh, steroids, so that I, it would reduce the swelling. So this was around the time that it was getting really bad, and I only slept a couple hours. So realistically, I listened to that album just on repeat. And uh, it still didn't kill the album for me. Like, you know how when you listen to, to the same song over and over, you're like, yeah, I really love this. And then over time, it's like, yeah, I know I really like it, but like, I've, I've listened to it enough. Let's listen to something else. And then you kind of get into a different groove. Yeah, never, yeah. Really, never really did that with, with that album. It's just, it's that good. Mm. And, then, and then you talk about The Wall and like how much, how many good things can you say about The Wall? A short, a shorter question: How many bad things can you say about the wall? Hmm. I don't know if I can say. I, okay, so I used to not like the song Vera. That song's awesome. And then you, yeah, this was, I told you that in college, and you said, "Nate, no, the song's awesome." I'm like, really? You think it's awesome? It's like, like, yeah, man, yeah, it's awesome. And. It took me a few years, but I think I might agree with you now. Really? I wouldn't say it's awesome, but it's pretty good. It's, um, it's, it feels kind of juxtaposed in the album. Like, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really mesh with anything else in the album, and it's kind of harsh, but I think it needs to be. Uh, I, actually... Connecting back to the whole multiple layers. So there's a lot with Vera that I kind of understood through the album as far as uh, Pink's relationship to his father, as well as Water's relationship to his father. Because his father died in the war. And 
and, you know, Pink Sid as well. You know, they're kind of the same character in a way. And, and, uh, what is military stick kind of fortitude that Pink has throughout the wall is the coming out of this kind of, this, uh, ineptitude to get over the fact that he's lost his father in the war. Uh, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a mention in, I forget what song it is, uh, in one of the songs that his uh, daddy's not, not coming home. Mm -hmm. uh, so his dad dies early on, and it's actually an extended song which was put on to the final cut called The Tiger's Last... Is it The Tiger's? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's that song again? The, the Tiger... I don't know what it is. You're looking it up. Yes, I'm. I'm looking it up. This is this is important uh, right now. I I should know uh, this. Uh, not the wall. The final cut. Cut. We can cut this out. But I'm not going to because it's a test. It's not the Gunner's Dream. Though the Gunner's Dream is an amazing song. Uh. There's no song on that album with a tiger in it. <laughs> when the tigers broke free. <coughs> huh? When the tigers broke free. Oh. So th that's actually a song that was on the Wall movie. But it wasn't actually on the Wall album. But it's another song that kind of goes into his relationship with his father. And, you know, throughout the course of the album, he kind of becomes more violent, more militaristic, and... A lot more uh, kind of just crazy and this is as you know he has like this kind of warring personality uh, excuse the pun with this whole thing uh, I think there's actually the part where he's just kind of watching like war films I think it's in uh, nobody's home and mm -hmm. it actually connects to a lot within the album but there's this kind of inner label layers. I think it's like the third layer down, because there's just a basic plot of the album, which you can get your head around. You know, a guy does this, blah, blah, blah. He throws a TV out a window, blah, blah, blah. But then there's also this third layer where you can actually kind of get into the mentality of Pink himself. And you actually kind of start seeing, okay, it actually kind of fits in with stuff. Although, you know, on the first listen, or you know, first hundred listens for myself, it didn't make much sense. Right. Yeah, I mean, I know you and I have spoken about about um, that song particularly. What's what's the name of that song? The one where it throws the TV out the window. What was the name of the song? Yeah. Uh, it's not. It's after. Wow, we're in, we're embarrassing. It's after empty spaces. I know that. I hope. So this this is part of the problem I have with music in general is I listen to almost entirely just the album full all the way through. And Oh, I'm sorry, are you stealing excuses? I'm just admitting I'm an ignorant <laughs> So sorry, I, I have an excuse here. Like I got called out <laughs> one time on not being a Beatles fan. And like I, I know the Beatles. I've listened to every Beatles album. You know, I can't remember them all because there's a lot of them. But I don't remember any of the song names. I didn't look at the song names. I just kinda, you know, did my workout. I listen to it. Are, are you a Beatles fan? Of course, I'm a Beatles fan. What do you mean, of course? You no. think people who aren't Beatles fans have invalid opinions? Oh. Or you're saying that it's ridiculous for me to suggest that you wouldn't be a Beatles fan, knowing you? Yes, that one. Well, it's like people who like okay. Pink Floyd typically like the Beatles. You know, if we're talking to, about the Bee Gees right now, you could be like, uh, okay, I don't know if you'd be into the Beatles. Oh, you mean like the the earliest Pink Floyd album, which sounds exactly like the Beatles? Yes. Stylistically? God. Yeah, that, that was weird. That album is awful. Also, one of my turns. One of my turns yeah, one of, coming on. Yeah, and I know that you were saying that it can be interpreted as like being one way, being taken as him being serious or him being sarcastic or him talking about things a different way how did you pitch that 
So the basic idea was that it's kind of like a Freudian slip taking past the breaking point. So, you know, with a Freudian slip, you have this unconscious kind of motive, and then you have your conscious motive. So you're trying to say, you know, uh, uh, what's a good example of a Freudian slip? I'm trying to think of that classic one. Let's see, but, but I think that if you were reading the lyrics, Maybe. But when you're listening to the way that it's being sung, there's absolutely no way that you can interpret it that way. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. And this is part of the issue with uh, it's a psychological phenomenon called dissociation. Uh, or rather, uh, it's called, uh, they used to be called split personalities, but that term is just not used anymore. It's called uh, dissociative identity disorder. And the basic idea is that we have all these different kind of personalities in our head. And they kind of seem, you know, they're all about the same, to be honest. But with someone who has dissociative personality, diverse, I can't say, the personal, whatever. They have, you know, they have these. Dissociative identity disorder. Yeah, dissociative identity disorder. They have these different kind of parts to them. Now, there's an issue with, say, people who have uh, experienced sexual abuse. Because in their mind, you know, someone might be kind of kind of coming on to them, and they might not want to date them at all, right? Or to do anything with them. But their body language is the complete opposite. So, and the way they're speaking, the way the way they can kind of convey themselves, they're trying to say, "Yeah, come at me," you know, you know, I I definitely want to have sex with you. But internally, they're like, "No, no," and this kind of phenomenon where they, you know, they are thinking one thing but doing the complete opposite. So they're kind of dissociated within their mind. So their, their mind's saying one thing, their body's saying another thing. And it gets very confusing. And similarly, in this kind of song, you know, Pink's mind is kind of saying one thing. You know, it's just trying to be, you know, nice and kind of funny, corny, kind of quirky. But then his body is actually acting very violent. It's being kind of crazy. And the way he's kind of, you know, expressing himself. And he actually scares off the girl. Mm, I don't know. I think he's just, He's just crazy. <laughs> well, that, that's that's I think true. that's a really, really in depth and um, and unique way to to look at that song specifically because I had never thought of it that way. Um, but I, I don't know. If I'll have to reread the lyrics and really, really comb over it in order to um, to, to get behind that or not. Mm, that's very. But I think I think regardless, it's. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty unique. So what would you say, kind of the, uh, the dichotomy, the, not dichotomy, the, uh, you know, the essence of that song is? Um, he, he drives away everybody that's close to him. He's, he's broken past his point of, um, of wanting to have anybody that loves him because, um, Everybody who has loved him has either left or has left in some way, be it physically upping and leaving or dying or something like that. So he's doing the classic technique that a lot of people do when they're hurt emotionally like that and driving people away, whether now within himself, he does not want that. His heart doesn't want that, but his mind is trying to protect his heart. And that's why at the end he's saying, why are you running away? Because like, he doesn't really want her to leave, but within, but he's trying to protect himself at the same time. And he's like, you're going to leave eventually. So he starts acting crazy on top of that. He's, his mind isn't in a stable place. And realistically he needs somebody there with him at this point more than ever, but he's gotten past the point where anybody can help him on a, on a, one-on-one -on -one emotional basis. Um, so does he need and want her? Yes, but he's, he's pushing her away at the same time. And I think that really adds, adds the layers to, to the duality of the character where he's, that's the breaking point between young pink and superstar pink, where he, in the beginning he was a normal person. And then 
eventually he turns into this absolutely insane. Um, and I mean, if you go by the music video dictator, yeah, it's also kind of strange or kind of ironic. <laughs> uh, I've heard this kind of put by other people, but he becomes more and more lonely, more and more isolated. You know, to the point where on side two of the album or side three, if it's the actual you know record, uh, he's actually behind the wall himself. You know, with Hey You. So the pain more famous he gets, the more he turns into superstar Pink, the more lonely he becomes. Which is kind of oh, absolutely. an ironic kind of twist. I don't even... See, what makes it ironic? The fact that as a superstar, everybody loves you, but he's more lonely. Yeah, yeah, so he has people adoring for his attention. People who just want to see him. People who are paying to see, you know, paying money to see him every night. Mm. And he just feels like no one actually wants to see him. Right. I feel like that's probably something that a lot of superstars really go through. Because the more famous you get, the more you have to question why people want to see you. That they want to see you because they actually like you or because they like the character that you portray. And at what point do you become the character? And I think that's really what what happens with Pink is he becomes the character Pink instead of becoming, you know, instead of being able to be himself. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a uh, social pressure in a way. Actually, actually I, got, I got an idea I want to throw out real quick. Uh, so... There's a saying in physics, like, uh, it takes two to kiss. And in a similar way, it takes two for a relationship. Now, in the case of getting super famous and super popular like that, it might be the case that Pink becomes kind of isolated because in every, inter action, in every interaction he has, it's all about him. The other person's never really ever there because they're all cater catering to his needs, his wants. They're all talking about his music. And... Even when he tries to get to know, say, some girl or some person, they might just kind of deflect or kind of just try to please him or try to just say what, you know, he th they think they, he wants to hear. So some of the loneliest might be from a kind of a, a I don't want to say a pseudo-narcissism, but a, uh, some kind of sectioning off. So people are making him kind of narcissistic by always insisting about talking about himself. Hmm. Yeah, and you don't know who's saying who's real and who's not real. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a scary kind of prospect, honestly. I mean, I assume that's what a lot of, and from what I've read, that's what a lot of famous people go through. It's hmm. like, like uh, people who win the lottery. They immediately they have a million friends and a million relatives who all come out of the woodwork and everybody needs $20,000. Like, how many of them were there before you won the lottery? You know what I mean? And how do you know, like, how do you, how do you, if you're single when you win the lottery, how do you ever find a girlfriend? How do you know that she's not there just because you're now $250 million richer? Yeah, it's got to be something always going through her head. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that that falls in line with, um, with with Pink in this situation. How do you know that they're not just there because you're famous? Because you could. Um, there's a a Rolling Stone song, right? Um, about um, maybe it's not Rolling Stones. Maybe it's Aerosmith. I don't know. Anyway, there's a rock song um, about uh, like she she took. Oh wait, it's Led Zeppelin, isn't it? Maybe you'll be able to tell me. Okay. Uh, um, like she she took my car um, and started telling everyone she's gonna be famous. She's gonna be uh, she's gonna be famous. Something like that. Wow, I sound like a fucking idiot. <laughs> it's okay. We all do. Do you? Do you know the Led Zeppelin song I'm talking about? She took my car, something famous. 
Yeah, she's telling. She started telling her friends she's gonna be famous or she's gonna be a singer or something like that. I mean, honestly, if it's Led Zeppelin, I probably don't know because I can't understand Rubber Plant for the life of me. It's in. Uh, I think it's in Black Dog. Maybe. It's like dun 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 moment. Leaving. Eleven. No, it's probably not that one. No, it's not that one. Hold on, I'll I'll find it. Keep talking though. Okay. Well, speaking of Led Zeppelin. Yeah, Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin's a, a great band as well. Um they they were way more hyper sexualized though, and I think it, I wouldn't say that it was they're a worse band than Pink Floyd because um, art is what it is. But I think that the that Pink Floyd's concepts add, added something that nobody else had ever done before, or arguably has ever done since. I think maybe a good metaphor would be that you always have to consider the use or the utility or the audience. You know, what is it for? Who is it for? And Led Zeppelin, I love Led Zeppelin. I'm not going to knock them at all. But they're pretty basic. They have some complexities in some of their songs. But they're, you know, they're pretty rockish. They're pretty, they're not really prog rock. It's not too much depth to what's going on. Uh, like, a lot of the songs are just, like, about, you know, girls and kind of relationship issues. And they're pretty cut and dry. There's no kind of real question about what is going on, or if someone's in the right and someone's in the wrong. There's not, like, a real depth to it. Or in the case of Pink Floyd, there's a lot of depth to it. And what is... The case, you have to kind of you know go through all the different kind of levels and kind of have to really analyze what's going on within the song to figure it out. Yeah, like you know, like uh, in the song "Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You," I think we can all come to the same conclusion that the song is about you know a guy, a singer, who is leaving his babe because he has to go touring. Mm. You know, it's, it's, there's no, like, <laughs> that that's all it is about. You know, there's no, nothing much more to that. Okay, Black Dog is what I was talking about. Um, the line goes, take too long before I found out what people mean by down and out. Spent my money, took my car, started telling her friends she's going to be a star. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, I, I um, never thought about long, that lyric. Long wrap around, but he's saying there, like, <clears throat> down and out didn't mean like that he was he wasn't he, he found out what it meant to really be down and out when all the people in his life became fake not when he was poor and like and living on the street but when he was rich and famous and he couldn't keep anybody around him because they were all fake that's what down and out really means and i think that that really draws a similarity to what we were talking about there. Hmm. Hmm. But yeah, the, uh, the depth of songs, uh, the, the, the depth of the lyrics and, and things like that. Um, I think you make a, a really good point there. I kind of wonder if it's more painful for a celebrity to lose a friend than it is for, you know, one of us to lose a friend. A non you, think, you don't think that would be relative? Well, I mean, let's let's say that as a celebrity, you find a really good friend who's also not a celebrity themselves, uh, and you you know they're a real genuine person, and they respect your ideas, they criticize you, and so on and so forth. Uh, to lose that person might be a little bit more painful because the ability to find a person just like that might be very, very difficult or might take a lot of work, a lot more time. And it's not saying that, you know, not finding people, you know, good people as a kind of a non-famous person is, you know, not difficult as well, but it's probably a lot harder if you're 
actually famous because, you know, the other people aren't judging you according to your fame. Now, do you think that that issue is derived from the fame or from the type of person who is liable to become famous? that they just have a hard time figuring out who's real and who's fake. Because maybe the type of person that gets famous is the type of person who themselves, you know, who doesn't realize within themselves whether they're real or fake. Like you could argue that case with Pink, where there's obviously that uh, dichotomy, I don't even know if I'm using that word right, but I'm going to use it, within himself between this very violent narcissistic person and this very troubled, hurt little boy. And they're always at, at war with each other. And one of them obviously is going to lose. And the loser has to be the little boy in that every time there's, there's really no fight there. It's so that the type of person who, uh, who becomes pink, who becomes somebody that famous, is the type of person who doesn't know if the people around him are, are real or if they're fake. Mm. That was awful explanation. I'm sorry. So just, just to clarify that a little bit. So is this kind of more like a kind of a, let's say a natural selection type effect where the people who can't, who can tell the difference between fake and non-fake people are the kind of people who kind of wouldn't, put themselves in those kind of situations and say miss out on opportunities? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if I'm sure. on face there, I think, just be I like... think that's a, a way to, to take it, to be able to discuss it. Yeah. Because like, it's, it's a proven fact that anybody can be a good leader, but certain types of people are more likely to become leaders because they seek out those positions. So that's more what I'm saying. Like all famous people don't have this issue, but more famous people have this issue than don't. And is it because that type of person has that type of issue? Mm -hmm. Is it about the personality, not the spotlight or does the spotlight and most likely this is the case because nothing's ever really black and white. Does the spotlight just make that situation worse? Well, you gotta imagine with, you know, us and, you know, everybody, for the most part, you know, our lives kind of do revolve around ourselves. And I think we all have that part within ourselves that kind of wants, you know, that kind of uh, attention, that fame, that kind of glory. Uh, personally, I don't feel like that myself, but, you know, I, I can assume that, you know, if I get put in that position and start getting praise from everybody, that part of my head's gonna kind of start swelling a little bit. And this might, this might, this might, you know, this must put people into an awkward situation where they're part of them who doesn't, part of them who doesn't want this fame, or they're kind of like a bit opposed to it. There's another part of them that wants it, keeps trying to get more of it, and that could probably definitely create loneliness. It's, it's, it's probably not a problem for people who are like sociopathic or whatever, but for someone who has like you know, is this kind of average person getting that kind of fame might kind of do that to your head because it's it's like it's like a it's like a drug, I guess, in a way. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I think we should, uh, we should, we should talk about, see, I still haven't answered the question about what my favorite Pink Floyd album is, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm going to think on that, and I think that we should come back to it. Well, yeah, you're not going to, because we're going to find out next time on We Have to Talk. Play the intro. Uh, it's, it's the outro. Play the outro. Also, this outro was brought to you by Pink Pandas oh, Riding... What, what? What? Oh, Pink Pandas Riding Purple Unicorns.
Stop.